So now I'm going to jump into uh, this first talk here, which we're, really this talk is to kind of set the stage for, for the rest of this conference. It's the, the state of SciML, right? What is scientific machine learning and the software ecosystem and how, it ha how has it been evolving? What, what have we been seeing? Where, what have we done? Where are we going next, right? This is, this is really what we want to, to showcase and then before we get into some of these details. So if this talk was in 2016 or 2017, uh, we would start, we would have the entire talk be about differential equations and differential equations.jl, right? And so we are, our early claim to fame was really, you know, hey, there, there are things that we can do in the modern differential equation space that can be done to, um, you know, improve performance, right? And it wasn't just improved performance over Pat, Python, MATLAB, and R, right? Th those are those were the targets that you know kind of got a, a large core of, of users. But what really got the developer community and you know even the numerical methods developer community uh, interested was that we were able to start besting even some of the best in class, you know, Fortran and C libraries. Um, and that was done through a multiple through two to methods, right? Uh, one one set of things was all the numer you know, in, advancing the numerical space. So things like new new uh, new linear solvers, uh, new computations of very core components like Blas components. But mixing that with new differential equation solvers or new iterations on differential equation solvers that were kind of not you know that were kind of lost to time. So I think that one nice uh, one nice uh, case here was Rodos four, right? So higher order Rosenbrock methods they require really they require really good Jacobian approximations in order to compute at the higher orders that they expect. And so for a long time, because finite differences was used for the the Jacobians, they were not very stable for for low orders, even though or for high accuracy, even though that's where they're most efficient. But when you start to combine that with automatic differentiation. That combination really changes the game, right? And so th this this combination of features has really brought differential equations together. It's new features, new algorithms, and new computational details that really came together. Um, and if this was 2017, right, I would give a whole talk just all about this topic. But we've really gone past this. So. You know, so this year, for example, uh, we, we have really gone uh, through this whole vertical area. So that way, you know, we, we, we're, we're even the core things like uh, the linear solvers, right? Everyone really re relies on things like BLOS and MKL. Well, these days we have our own tools that are written in Julia because in large swaths of, of the, you know, in large swaths of ODEs, these new tools are outperforming on modern CPUs. And so this gives us a whole range of, of places where we've been doing the research is, you know, the linear solve, the nonlinear solve, the ODE solve, all the way to Gillespie, and basically everything up. Um, and, and so, uh, where, how we got to this, right? And I think that the, the core fundamental principle, um, the core fundamental principle was really that, you know, we took a pro an approach where we said, we will benchmark everything. And so if you go to bench, SignML benchmarks, uh, dot jail, you'll see that there's benchmarks on all sorts of different problems. There is dedicated compute. So that way, when anyone opens a pull request to change a model or change, you know, or, or update packages, I mean, we'll rerun the benchmarks on this compute and it has GPUs, it has, uh, you know, parallel CPUs. And so we can just see how everything is working. And by, by really using this, you know, using a benchmark based approach, a very empirical approach, we've been able to just grow our performance uh, improvements over, over the years. Um, but what, what really happened from that, though, is that once you have a developer community where you have all of these you know, develop where you have all these developer tools, where you have all of these benchmarking tools. We saw that this became a community not just for software developers, but also for developers and methods, right? So, uh, one one really interesting case here was IRK Gauss Legendre, which is a very specific kind of method, right? This kind of method is a me is a sixteenth order ODE solver, which is really made for cases where you want more than floating point accuracy in your solves on equations which are you know have symplectic properties um and so where what what happened was you know researchers in these kinds of methods came to SciML because this became a place where hey we have all these benchmarking tools available let's just develop our methods on this interface and what do you know now i can write a whole paper just by showing you know adding my methods to the benchmark suite and releasing it out into the wild and so what we've done is we've worked with a lot of these methods developers to get these packages up, to get these packages optimized, and, and even more importantly, get them as part of the community so that way they have a maintenance structure so they would exist and be usable 20 years from now, 30 years from now. 
So, so you know, and it wasn't just a one-off approach. Uh, there's a lot of other cases of this. In fact, our keynote speaker today um, will be talking about stochastic differential equations, and he is and his student recently released a new stochastic differential equation package, which completely changed the efficiency of how we can compute levy areas, which is a fundamental detail to higher order non-commutative stochastic differential equations. And of course, the, 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 the speaker will go in much more detail into this, but, but, but the key idea here is that we've now developed this community where the research happens here, and so, you know, it, within just months, you know, you have these brand new methods, these really core improvements, orders of magnitude improvements, entering core packages like stochastic DFDQ and becoming the things that users automatically get. So, you know, you've probably been seeing that your performance has been growing on, uh, you know, over time, you know, your performance improvements. And this really hasn't just been, you know, two developers or something. This has been 50, 100 developers in a large community because of these, these developer processes. Um, and, you know, there's tons of other examples that I can showcase here. I'm only going to showcase two because otherwise the whole talk will be on this. So if you want yours to be showcased here at SignMailCon, I'll say, you know, please, please uh, sign up to give a talk for the next time. Um, but essentially what, what we've grown into, right, we've, we've grown from something that was about just differential equations to an ecosystem that has linear solvers, nonlinear solvers, optimization, uh, data-driven uh, discovery tools, uh, methods for solving inverse problems, symbolic modeling tools. And we put this all into one cohesive uh, or, you know, one, one cohesive group that is able to, to pull all these together. So modeling toolkit allows for symbolic solving and it generates equations for nonlinear solve. Differential equations.jl also works with modeling toolkit, but if you ask it for a steady state equation, it uses nonlinear solve, right? Um, if you use data-driven DiffEQ to be able to generate differential equations from data, the differential equations that it generates, it shows you them in symbolic form for modeling toolkit, and then you can solve, and then you can simulate them with differential equations. Right? All of these tools start to work together to pr promote the research in each aspect because it now, you know, now users only or developers and researchers only need to focus on one one area in order to get the benefits of all these pieces. Um, and, and so we, we've seen a lot of nice research come out of this. So for example, a talk that we'll see later today is about how an infinite time neural ODEs can actually be faster to train and faster to use than finite time ODEs, uh, neural ODEs. And that's something that might be, you know, a bit mind boggling. It comes from an idea about the implicit function theorem. Um, and I won't go into too much detail because this is exactly one of the talks that we'll have later today at, at, uh, at SciMelCon. Um, now, and what, what's really evolved from here is that in order to get these models and get these methods out to more people, we've been developing a lot of front ends for specific applications. So here, for example, is catalyst.jl, which gives a reaction network syntax. So that way, a very chemical reaction syntax can be shown and, and used by users. And this right here, right, is, is not just, you know, this in, in Unicode or something, right? This right here is runnable code. This right here is runnable code that will simulate these, these chemical reactions, either with stochastic equations or in the uh, deterministic form with ODEs. But you know, as this is part of the, the SIMO universe, um, this is not something that just simulates, it's something that simulates rather fast. So this is uh, this I'm pulling from an unpublished paper. This, the preprint should be going out in about a month or so um, about catalyst.jl and if you jump. And what we show is that if you use that interface, right, something that looks very close to the science, um, what you get is you get something that it simulates the equations, you know, these stochastic equations with Gillespie simulations. They're simulating about two orders of magnitude, three, four orders of magnitude faster than a lot of the other um, packages that are out there, right? So we've really found a way, you know, building on top of the tools of Julia to be able to get this, this Pareto Optima, you know, or at least get close to this Pareto Optima in terms of features plus performance um, and simplicity. And, and so, what, where this has really gone then is that we've been expanding in a way so that way, you know, applications can use their application specific formulas without hassle. So we can read in SBML models, cell ML models, BioNetGen. This is showing how, um, how systems biology, for example, has a whole pipeline directly from 
you know, their, their core formats directly to the differential equation solvers. But it's not just in the, you know, it's not just systems biology. That's just one example of many. There's Pumas for uh, pharmaceutical modeling, which we'll have a talk earlier th later this morning. There's packages for uh, orbital trajectories, a lot of space science applications, uh, power systems dynamics. And, and this is really just, a sh once again, this is just a short list of all of these different applications that we're seeing use this, uh, this, this set of tools. And so now researchers who are working on numerical methods, they can ask questions like, does this new, uh, ODE solver improve a climate model? And once you put it into, uh, once you put something into the differential equations.jl interface, you can actually use, say, the climate climate model and see how the performance changes in real climate models, right? Not just not just these toy problems. And this has really changed the game for what we see happens in research. But all of these assume that you have an idea of the model, right? So where where the research really went in say you know twenty uh, in twenty twenty was this question of can we start to help help users build models as well. And so this was a combination of tools, so a combination of neural networks, be able to learn from data, along with symbolic uh, regression tools, be able to change the neural networks into, um, into symbolic equations, right? So this was the universal differential equation approach that mixed symbolic regression with, uh, with kind of these partial neural ODEs and, symbol and, um, and numerical data. And we were able to show that, you know, on these toy equations, like, hey, this, this idea worked. But I think what really shows the state of SciML is to just look through some of the citations, right? You know, where, where, where has this actually gone, right? Because as a software, right, the, the, the true sign of software moving is the users doing something else with it. So, you know, we were able to show that, hey, on toy problems like La Volterra, we were able to, you know, get perfect extrapolation, right? But what happens, say, when you have partial information about uh, black hole dynamics and you say, I want to correct the black hole dynamics with universal function approximators? Well, this was done by, by um, other scientists over uh, with the LIGO black hole data. And here you go, you see that they learn from a small set of data. And when they extrapolate forward, it's able to have very similar performance to what we showed on toy problems, right? Um, and so, you know, the, the blue matches up with the orange, this extrapolation, it's able to learn a very successfully learn uh, models using this partial information. And so you might go, well, okay, you know, one example, you know, one real world example is not enough. And if, I mean, we're, we're to the point now where the SIMO organization is, is mature enough that we can just kind of go through uh, a bunch here. So let me, let me just kind of walk through some. Right, so uh, we'll have a speaker later today, which we'll be talking about deep NLME, which is a case where uh, you cannot directly do something like symbolic regression. You cannot directly do some of these methods, but by training a neural network inside of a nonlinear mixed effects model, you can then pull the neural network out and learn symbolic terms and make it so that way you can learn models that will that will be predictive of how um, of how uh, patients will change with respect to different dosing. So pharmacology was another domain you know, where, where this ended up working out. But you know, is it pharmacology and black hole dynamics? No, uh, well, what about um, earthquake safe buildings, right? So here, once again, uh, you had partial information model and it, it learns from a small set of data. And when you extrapolate that into the future, it learns a, a correct enough model to be able to you know, extrapolate. So, okay, now building design, uh, are, what, what else ha have, have we been successful in? Well, um, the better battery models is another one, right? So here's a universal differential equation was used, something called self-fit, um, to be able to improve the predictions of how batteries degrade. Um, wh where else do we go? Um, there's methods for combustion modeling, um, using the same kind of idea of diff you know, uh, partial, partially known uh, structures about chemical reaction networks. You mix that with the differentiable uh, ODE solver. And this has a, you know, Aranaeus.jl, a Julia package, which, which goes along with this. Um, are there more applications? You know, uh, new propulsion devices, which use neural networks inside of partially known partial differential equations. You train these neural networks and you extrapolate forward, right? I can keep on going through these examples, but I, I, I think that what really shows the success, I mean, this really shows the success of the CIMO, you know, organization and, and, and the software, right? We, we should really be proud of, you know, not just what we've been able to show in, in our own papers and work, but really how others have, have taken it and really expanded upon it and really begun to use this to be able to solve, you know, these real world problems. Um, and what, one of our developers even, you know, here's, here's just another nice case, um, using this to be able to control qubit preparation in quantum circuits, right? You know, so, 
So here, this, this is really pulling all these different threads together. It's uh, optimal control of stochastic differential equations using differentiable stochastic differential equation solvers um, built on Rosler, Andreas Rosler's methods. You differentiate through all of them, and now you get to control, uh, you, be able, you can be able to control the qubits for possibly building uh, future quantum computers, right? So all of this really comes together, um, it, or all of this has really been coming together in these last uh, few years. Um, yeah, and and as as I said, you know, I can just keep on going through examples. So let, let's let's really get to this last part here, right? So you know, we we've mentioned where SciML has has gone, right? So it started as you know, hey, we're differential equation solvers and we're fast, but it's really moved to being this whole ecosystem where you know you can define a PDE and it uses ODE tools and you can use symbolic modeling tools, a modeling toolkit, and Symbolics.jl. And uh, you know you can pull all this together with automatic differentiation, right? We've really moved into a space that encompasses a lot of uh, scientific computing, but um, but but where where do we really need to go next, right? Uh, I think that there's there's a lot of things that I could mention. Uh, let me just I'm going to highlight these three, right? So there's also going to be talks on improving the symbolic tooling, nonlinear optimal control, right? New, new using machine learning to generate new uh, solvers. But I think that I want to focus on uh, some next steps that I think can really pull in some of the community, really pull in some new developers. And this is places like uh, PDE interfaces, um, unified documentation, and modeling standard libraries. So, you know, what 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 are some things that you should expect to see? You know, some major growth in in the next year or so. So, um, so. Right, so when we look at the, the current state of, of PDEs, right, um, what where we're really trying to go to is an interface where you can define a PDE symbolically and be able to solve it with many different methods. And, and really the first method that we had out there was these physics-informed neural networks, right, where you can define this symbolically. So you say, hey, this is a second derivative with respect to X, second derivative with respect to Y. And so uh, the Laplace equation is, well, you just write it out, right? This is how it'd be written somewhat in, in a book. You give it the, the boundary conditions. You say, this is my PDE system. And now here's what I, what I want to do is I want to discretize it with respect to a physics performed neural network and solve it, right? Um, but that's one type of discretization, right? You're, so a discretization in this sense is saying, I want to change a PDE system into some numerical problem uh, in which I can then numerically solve to get a solution. When you use physics informed neural networks, that discretization is to a, no, a nonlinear optimization problem. And when you solve the optimization, you get the weights of a neural network that gives you a PDE solution. And so this interface, though, can be used with a lot of different uh, PDEs. So, for example, you know, when we when we can keep exactly the same setup, but can say, hey, you know, here's um, MLL finite difference. So here's method of lines.jl doing a finite difference discretization on the same PDE input. Um, then, and then solving this using the differential equation solvers, right? So it's, instead, in this case, it's generating an ODE using the finite difference method, but giving you the same kind of output. And there's a lot, there's a lot more that we need to go to, right? So in, you see that, you know, in this slide, I left off how you plot it because the plotting can be kind of complex for a physics informed neural network, whereas it can be easier maybe for a uh, method of lines, finite difference solution. And so one of the things that we're going to need to move to is unifying the interface on the, on the output, but also expanding the, the, the role and, and the amount of, of different types of solvers we have on here. So we have physics informed neural networks, we have finite difference, and if you want to use neural operators, like Fourier neural operators and deep O-nets, um, then, you know, you can use neural operators.jl, um, you know, but you can't do it directly on the symbolic interface. But we also need to do finite volume, finite element, pseudo-spectral. And there's so many tools in the Julia ecosystem that we can build off of to be able to really make a really robust, you know, and really strong uh, symbolic modeling interface. And so this is going to be one of the large projects I'll be working on over the next few years to really make it so that way it's a really right one solve and solve anywhere kind of PDE ecosystem. Um, and now, why 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 is that important? Like, why why not just let someone use use a different package from their physics and form neural networks from and, and use a different package for a finite difference and be okay with it? I think that what what really is driving me to, to this is that it will accelerate the science of scientific machine learning. Right. So one of the things that we saw when, you know, when physics informed neural networks and such were coming out was that we can benchmark, say, between, uh, you know, solving an inverse problem between, you know, physics informed neural networks and universal differential equations. And if you spend the time to do it, you can find like, 
oh, hey, on the Lorentz equation example from the deep XDE paper, you know, uh, it takes 300 seconds with the physics informed neural network and uh, 0.03 seconds with the, with the, with, you know, DiffEQ flux. And therefore for this kind of ODE problem, it would be better to use DiffEQ flux, but, you know, do not extrapolate that out because as you go to different PDEs or different equations, different workflows, right? The relative performance between methods can change. And so in order to really build a, a wide spanning, um, you know, view of how, you know, what, when are our methods optimal and what should we be using? We really need it to be much easier, you know, not having to use two programming languages and everything. We need to make it easy to be able to switch between them, um, switch between different methods. I think one story that really follows from this is uh, if you take a look, for example, at this paper on uh, on deep O nets, you'll find that they, they mentioned that, you know, uh, that, you know, the, their methods were able to solve the, a lot of ODEs and PDEs at a fraction of computational cost uh, with respect to classical solvers, right? And so, you know, a lot of these things are driving for, you know, like we should be using deep ONETs everywhere. Um, and so, you know, if you take a the, take the paper from here, or if, if you take the equations from here, this is the speed on the Robertson equation showing that a deep ONET was able to vastly outperform a numerical solver. And, but, you know, here's a question, like what happens if we do that with the Julia numerical solver? Um, and you can see that if we, you know, uh, comparing a deep ONET, which was on a Tesla V1, C, uh, V100 GPU, right? I compared it to this uh, little, this little, you know, laptop with a little uh, CPU, and um, we were able to get about 7,000 times faster than the deep ONET um, using this, right? So, and really what I, I really what I want to highlight here is not that, oh, hey, here's a, here's a case where, you know, where we overturned result or something. But what I think is really important is that, it's really hard to optimize classical numerical solvers, right? It's much easier to optimize something with a machine learning framework. And so without giving researchers a tool that makes it easy to have an optimal form of both, we cannot uh, really push forward this field. And so really where I think that, that this kind of PD interface will, will be helpful is making it easy to get a very optimized example with you know, the classical methods and the scientific machine learning methods to really figure out where each type of method does best. And I, I think that you know, the current state of things is not good for researchers. I wouldn't say that the researcher made any mistake here. Instead, the issue is that we don't have the software to make it so that way it's easy to not make this mistake. And so this is what we want to be solving. Um, and, you know, I can, we can do a whole talk on how this, the same thing applies to the results in the 4A neural operator paper and such, right? Th this, this is something that, that's very pervasive. And so uh, I'm, I'm going, I'm almost near the end of my time here. So I want to mention just a few other thrusts. One of the things that we, that happens then when we, as we've grown this ecosystem is that we have this huge documentation of, of very different methods, right? Um, but all of these are different documentations. And so what we need to do is we need to reformat our documentation so that way we have all of the packages put together and be able to make it so that way we can easily go from you know, data-driven DiffEQ to DiffEQ flux and all that. Um, so if we're looking for developers to really help us reformat our documentations in a multi-package kind of form. And lastly, you know, we've been hearing from everyone that you know the, these tools like Modelic and Simulink have these open model libraries. We've been st we've started a, a project called Modeling Toolkit Standard Library to build out such a standard library, and it's still in its very early days. But I think this will be one of our important projects over the next year. Um, so yeah, what else are we working on? It's basically everything in your imagination, and this is what Siamel Khan is all about, right? Because I'm just one person talking about what we're working on, but there's hundreds of developers out there, so you know, let's let the conference go. Let, let's, we'll let you talk about what you're working on as well, because SciML is what everybody's working on in the SciML universe. Um, so yeah, so please remember to register, um, and we'll we'll cut to move to the next part of the um, next part of the schedule here. I think that I do have two minutes to to answer a question here or there. So I'll just ask you one quick question from from the Discord. Um, which part of the uh, SciML ecosystem is the most mature and which part is the least mature, according to you? Yeah, so the most mature mature person uh, uh, per area of the SciML is definitely the differential equation solvers, right? So the core differential equation solvers for doing things like solving large partial differential equations, you know, mixing with, you know, preconditioners and all that, that's really been our core for a very, very long time. 
Um, you know, the things where, that have more medium matureness are things like uh, differentiability, you know, adjoint methods and such. We, there's a lot that is there. There's a lot that, that people are using and everything. So I wouldn't say, you know, it's it's fairly mature, but it's, there are still a lot of things that we want to be working on, right? So um, there's still more performance that we can pull out of it, et cetera. Um, things that are a bit less mature, I would say, are things that are built on the symbolic ecosystem, right? So built, Julia Symbolics is in, in, it's an entire package ecosystem that itself is only one year old that was spawned out of this IML project. Um, so Symbolics and Modeling Toolkit, right? Th these are some major areas that we'll be that are we are working on going forward. You can see that it has many different talks in here, like you know, the internals of modeling toolkit, symbolic array, structural identifiability. This all uses uh, the symbolic tooling, but it's still very it's very early in it, uh, in its days. So um, I would say that the symbolics and modeling toolkit is the least uh, the least mature of the areas, but it's probably getting the most development effort.